and what did the female say to you? And she says that her stepfather is killing everybody in her house. Can I roll over? I ain't gonna hurt you. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna hurt nobody. You got anything on you? No, I ain't got nothing, man. Phone, that's it. You see, Claremont County prosecutors are calling this the most heinous crime on their books. They say Chad Dorman gave a full confession, admitting he didn't just shoot his sons on a whim. No, this was something he planned for months. A judge has ruled that Chad Dorman's confession that he allegedly gave during his interrogation will be thrown out. Today, Chad Dorman taking a plea deal that spares him the death penalty, but it will send him to prison for the rest of his life. June 15th, 2023 was a beautiful and sunny day in the small town of New Richmond, Ohio. A family of six was enjoying a Thursday afternoon at their home, spending time playing outside, enjoying each other's company, and sharing some laughs. Little did anyone know that what would also happen on this day would be the worst tragedy to ever occur in the history of this small town because a father decided to execute his three young sons in front of their mother and their sister. And to this day, no one really knows why. This is the case of Clayton, Hunter, and Chase Dorman. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you are new here. My name is Jen, and I talk about true crime cases here on YouTube, especially cases that I feel need a lot more awareness. Today, we are going to be talking about the case of Chad Dorman, the Ohio man who executed his three young sons in 2023. I'm sure many of you have already heard about this case before, and I actually did cover this before on my channel. But since there are a lot of recent updates, I'm going to make a brand new video and just remove the old one. Now, this is one of those cases that I genuinely think about almost every single day. For what appeared to be a regular guy to just randomly execute his three sons in front of their mother and sister for no reason at all. It's just absolutely terrifying to know that these kinds of monsters exist and they look like just regular people. Before I go into any details of today's case, I want to give a major trigger warning that I will be discussing the deaths of three young boys. If this is something that you feel like you cannot watch, please go ahead and skip this video. I also want to mention that I will not be saying the names of the mother or the sister because I do feel like they deserve their privacy and it's really not needed to say their full names. With all of that being said, let's get into the details of today's case and start talking about the Dorman boys. Clayton, Hunter, and Chase Dorman lived in Monroe Township, Ohio, in a home with their mother, sister, and father, 32-year-old Chad Dorman. The Dorman boys were three adventurous little boys who just loved being outdoors. They loved doing all kinds of activities together, like go-karting, swimming, and fishing. But most importantly, they loved spending time together, as the boys were just inseparable. Their father, Chad, worked full-time as an insulator and was usually gone at work during the weekdays. Their mother was a stay-at-home mom and spent her days taking care of the children and all household duties. From the outside, it appeared as though this was a loving and happy family. No one had any idea that for several months, Chad Dorman had been planning the murders of his three little boys. In the week leading up to June 15th, nothing was really out of the ordinary. June 10th, 2023 was a normal day. Chad took the boys out for a boys' day while his wife took her daughter out for a girls' day. The next day, on the 11th, Chad took the boys fishing. On June 12th and 13th, those were also normal days. Nothing unusual happened on these days, but Chad did mention that he was having some trouble sleeping. On June 14th, Chad woke up his stepdaughter before he left for work around 5 or 6 a.m., which was something that he had never done before. He woke her up and apologized to her for anything that he had ever done to hurt her. He then told her to go back to sleep, and he just left for work. He spent the day at work, and then he coached Clayton's baseball game when he got off, like he usually did. But on this night, he was unable to get any sleep at all.
On the morning of June 15th of 2023, Chad left for work as usual around 6 a.m. On the way to work, he searched and listened to a song called Happy in Hell by Colt Ford. He was at work for just a few hours, but he seemed very on edge the whole time. He ended up leaving work early and he stopped by a Kroger store around 9.40 a.m. He is seen on camera walking over to the vitamin section for a bit and then he stopped by the Little Clinic counter. The Little Clinic is a walk-in clinic located inside of the Kroger store, and this is where you can get help with just generic health concerns. Although it's unclear exactly what the conversation was, it was reported that Chad had spoke with his mother that morning and he told her that he was having some feelings. So she is the one that actually recommended he go down to this clinic. But he ended up leaving the clinic after just two minutes without signing in or talking to any staff. After leaving Kroger, he went home, grabbed a 16-ounce can of Bud Light, and went outside to do some yard work. His wife and children were all out running some errands, but they returned home just a short time later. It was a beautiful and warm Thursday afternoon, and the boys of course wanted to play outside. So Chad spent some time playing with the boys in the front yard while his wife went inside to make them all some lunch. When his wife finished making lunch, they all came in and sat down at the table to eat. While eating, Chad kept referring to this lunch as his last good meal. Now this comment immediately alerted his wife because she thought it was obviously a very odd comment to make. But she began to think to herself that maybe Chad had been depressed and maybe he was thinking of hurting himself. No part of her in any way thought that he would ever hurt the children or even her. Around 12.50 p.m., Chad calls his dad and speaks to him for a few minutes. During that conversation, he made a weird comment to him saying, Clayton is going to be the hardest. From around 1 to 3.30 p.m., Chad continued to do yard work and play with the boys outside. At 3.30 p.m., he began to read the Bible to Hunter for about 15 minutes, and then he began to pace around the house holding that Bible and mumbling to himself, Chad knows what's right. Around 3.45 p.m., Chad walks into the bedroom and opens the gun safe where they had a rifle. This immediately alarmed his wife, and she immediately went into the room and told Chad that he was scaring her. But Chad just responded saying, I'm just joking, I'm just playing around, and then he closed the safe and told her that he wanted to lay down and take a nap. Now at this point, she was extremely worried about him. And again, she was just worried about him because she was under the assumption that he was wanting to hurt himself, which honestly makes sense. When someone is pacing around the house, holding a Bible, repeating to themselves that they know what's right, telling themselves that this will be their very last good meal, and then finally walking into a bedroom where they had a weapon, I think anybody would assume that this person might be thinking of hurting themselves. And this is exactly what his wife believed. She genuinely believed that he was going to hurt himself. And because she was worried about him and she was worried about leaving him alone, she grabbed the three boys and they all joined him in the room together to all take a nap. Around 4 p.m., Chad got out of bed and grabbed the rifle out of the gun safe. At that moment, his wife was still concerned that he was going to hurt himself, so her and the boys all sat there and begged for him to put the weapon down, reminding him that they all loved him very much. The wife tried to call 911, but Chad grabbed her phone from her, told her it was too late, and then pointed the weapon at Hunter and shot him. She immediately screamed for the other two boys to run out of the house and she tried to render aid to Hunter. And around this time, she also tried to grab her phone so that she could call 911 and get help there right away. Right before Hunter was shot, the stepdaughter was actually in a different room and she heard the commotion from the boys and the mother screaming at him, telling him to put the weapon down. She started to walk to the room and as soon as she got there, that's when she saw that Hunter was shot. She immediately started running out of the house with the boys. She ran out of the house right behind Clayton and was yelling for him to keep running. Clayton ran out of the back door, but Chad did spot him and shot at him once, causing Clayton to fall to the ground. He then very calmly walked up to Clayton and then fired two shots at close range. The stepdaughter witnessed 
all of this happen. So right after she saw that Clayton was shot, she ran back inside of the house to try to grab Chase and get him out. She found Chase, grabbed him, and then ran outside and started running towards the fire station that was right down the street. But Chad eventually caught up to them and started pointing the rifle at her. She begged for him not to shoot her. He calmly told her to put Chase down, so she did. As soon as she put him down, Chase began running towards some trash cans to try to hide from Chad. Chad did try to fire right here, but he ran out of bullets. He reloaded the rifle and began walking up to Chase who was hiding behind some trash cans. Before Chad could fire, his wife came up behind him and started struggling for the gun. She kept trying to grab it away from him and even tried to put her thumb over the barrel of the gun, hoping that she could do literally anything to stop him from killing Chase. But even with her thumb over the barrel of the gun, he fired a shot, shooting her thumb, and killing Chase right in front of her. After taking the lives of his three sons, he then calmly picks up the bodies of Clayton and Chase and places them in the yard next to Hunter, where their mother was screaming and trying to resuscitate him. Roughly five minutes after the first 911 call, the wife calls 911 again to report that all three of her sons had been shot. Around this same time, another 911 call was placed by someone driving down the street saying that a teenager was running around yelling that her dad was killing her brothers. Um, I am, I'm, uh, there's a girl uh, running down the street saying that her stepfather is killing everyone in her family. Um, it's on the corner of uh, where there's a body shop in the fire department. Do you know what road this is? Okay, what's your name? You ran to the fire department. What's your name? Do you know what road this is? Laura Lendell Road. what? It's Laura Lendell Road. Okay, and what did the female say to you? And she says that her stepfather is killing everybody in her house. I did. I'm call I'm on the phone with them right now. Did you say how or what was happening? I asked her I asked her to get in the car with me and she said she couldn't leave her family. But she I think she ran to the fire department. So she went to the fire station. What did she look like? She's a, a she, she's probably a young teenager, probably like 15, uh, six, 16 maybe, with long blonde hair. Um, and she, she has a baby? black dog. Did she say anything about a baby? I, I don't know about no baby. She said she just couldn't leave her family. But I see a car running around. I'm sorry. Do you see anything from the house? All I, I well, so I drove down the road a little bit, so I was afraid that I was going to get shot myself since I interacted with her face to face. Um, so I, I'm just about like uh, maybe three houses down, um, but she's like waiting at the corner. I don't know what she's doing, but I kind of still see her in the corner. But I saw a car kind of came around and whipped around, so I'm not exactly sure if that's him or or or. If he's chasing her or not. I'm what, sorry? What kind of vehicle was it? Um, I, I saw it. It was like a gray. Did you see that car whip around? It's one of the fire department guys. I, 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 okay. I think maybe a fire department guy. I, it was a regular kind of focused looking gray car. Okay. We have help on the way. Thank you Dark so gray. You okay. All right. Call us back, okay, and steer clear of the area at this time. Okay. okay. Officers arrived around 4.25 p.m. As they were approaching, they could see the bodies of three children lying in the yard. A mother is seen lying by her children, screaming the words, He took my life from me. And Chad Dorman is calmly sitting on the front stoop of his home with the rifle he used to execute his three children sitting right next to him. Just so everyone's aware, somewhere in the mix there's a 16 year old female that ran from the original house that was going to the firehouse for help. Not sure where she's at now. 63, do we have the scripts on the mail? Negative, this was called out that the shooting was occurred by the fire station. They all are back inside of the firehouse. Three children have been shot, not breathing. Additional call sounds like the shooter is the father of the children. The female that went to the 
the firehouse is advising them that the male shot the entire family. Where's he at? Here. Here. He's there. Shooter's still on the porch. Get him right here. Right here. You got him on the porch. Right here. Not the last place we've been told. You show me your hands now! Stand up and Stand walk, up, walk towards us! Stand up now! Walk towards us! Stand up with your hands up! Stand up now! His name is Chad Dorman. Chad Dorman. Hey. I, go. I know, but we can't. You're going in first aid and he's not complying. And you know he's a shooter, shoot him. We gotta find cover first. We ain't no good if we ain't safe or so. Hey, hey, no. We need to come from this side where we can see them. Don't take cover behind her. We see them. We're going to approach from this side. We got cover. Right here. Big cover. We got to go. 29 and 63 attack us. We're going to get right now. Show us your Show fucking your hands, hands now! Stand up! Stand up! Stand up! Stand up now! Stand up! Stand the fuck up! Get your hands out of here. Tell them we're 21. It's in the air. Is this guy? There's people that need first aid, and that's the shooter. He's not complying. They need to take care of the victims. I got it. They have to shoot him and shoot him. We're completely sober. 63. We're 21. Get the EMS over here. Well, I, I did drugs when I split, but I don't need drugs now. I'm sober. I'm not trying to fight you. 63. Get your butt inside. Gatlin, get your butt inside. We on primary? Now. 29, we got three kids down. 63, we're 21. Have EMS respond over here. You're clear, they're being advised. Robert, 34, just start a mass cast. 63, do you want them to respond to the Laurel Lindale address? Where exactly do you need them? We're right in the front yard. What are you doing, man? Hey, pretty copy all this. Can I roll over? I ain't gonna hurt you. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna hurt nobody. You got anything on you? No, I ain't got nothing, man. Phone, that's it. I ain't mad. I ain't, I ain't nothing. Just make sure that dog don't come out. I don't think he'll bite you. Just don't reach for him and try to grab him and pet him. All right. He won't bite you. What's going on, man? Nothing. Uh, can I stand up? It's kind of uncomfortable. I'm gonna get I ain't you gonna do nothing. I ain't running away. You can do whatever you want with me. Here. You the only one else inside the house? What? You the only one else inside yeah, the house? Yeah, yeah. Sit down right uh, here. My my daughter, she ran over to the fire department. Sit down. Uh, it's my stepdaughter. Put him in the cage. Yeah, yeah. Listen, look, look. Can you get the wallet out of my back pocket? Shut up, dude. 
Yeah, the right from the main saw is fucking easy. Okay. I don't understand is how someone like this can act as though they are just a regular human being and they should be treated as such. Saying I'm uncomfortable to officers who are literally looking at your three children that you just shot lying in the yard. Telling officers you're not going to hurt them when you just killed three of your sons. He's talking to these officers as if they're supposed to show him some sort of compassion or they're supposed to be nice to him. And he even seems a lot more concerned about the dog than he does about anything else that's going on. Chad was arrested and charged with nine counts of aggravated murder and two counts of felonious assault. He was held on a $20 million bond, which is the highest bond ever set in Claremont County's history. The prosecution in this case made it clear that they were seeking the death penalty if Chad was convicted. During his initial interview with detectives, he gave them a full confession, telling them that he hadn't slept in three to four days and that he had actually been thinking about killing his son since October, eight months before the murders. Although he did confess to being the one that killed his sons, he never told the detectives why he did it. On March 15th of 2024, Judge Richard Ferenc threw out the entire confession, ruling that Chad's rights were violated after he was arrested. It was found that when Chad was arrested, he was never read his full Miranda rights, and he never signed the printed waiver of his rights. The detective instead verbally read Chad his Miranda rights, but he did not read them word for word. All right, now you discussed briefly the, uh, the Miranda rights. You did not read all the Miranda rights on State Exhibit 3, did you? On your card? Word for word, no. Well, you left out some pretty important parts, didn't you? No, I think I covered the important parts, and he understood that he had the right to an attorney, and he had the right to have an attorney if he could not afford one. Okay. Those are the important parts, and he understood that. Well, you left out the part as far as that right to an attorney is. You, you did say you have the right to talk to a lawyer for advice before we ask you any questions. But the part of the card goes on to say, and to have a lawyer with you during questioning. You did not read that part, did you? No. Why not? That kind of uh, is redundant and it kind of repeats itself and it's not the important part for me. Well, I'm not. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, one's talking about advice before you question, and the other's talking about having a lawyer present during questioning, isn't it? Yes. Um, I'm not a robot. I, I probably should have read the entire card, but I'm not a robot. Uh, and then you read, if you cannot afford a lawyer, one will be appointed that you left out for you before any questioning, if you wish, right? Again, yes, I must have left that out. It was also found that just five minutes into the interview, Chad stated, quote, I'll wait for a lawyer. And they actually go on to discuss the lawyer, but the detectives continue to question him after this, stating Chad did not make it clear that he wanted a lawyer. Here is the transcript from what happened in that interview. Chad says, I'll wait for a lawyer. I really don't know. Give me a couple of days and let me talk to a lawyer so I can get nice, good answers. Detective Ross replies, I understand. Do you have a lawyer? We have family lawyers. Who is that? Is there somebody I can call? Keith Dorman. Is he related to you? Yes. How is Keith related to you? My dad, Ruby Franklin. She is in the CIA. Is she a lawyer? Is Ruby a lawyer? She is in the CIA. I know. I heard you say that, but I didn't know maybe if she was a CIA attorney or... But you said your dad is a lawyer? Mm-hmm. We have a family lawyer. All right, but you don't know who that is? No. Detective Ross claimed that Chad did not make it clear that he wanted a lawyer, so they continued to question him after this. 
but because of this, the judge threw out everything that was said by Chad in this entire interview, including his full confession and how he said he had been planning this murder for eight months. And as you question him further um, about what had happened that day and how he was feeling, um, at approximately 45 minutes, 45 seconds into Exhibit 4A, um, what, if anything, did he say about a lawyer? Um, well, when it, I feel like there was, we were talking about, um, you know, his emotions and how he was feeling, and he made some comments about, um, not what happened that day, but just made some comments that I thought were very important, and I was kind of exploring that, and then he did, yes, make a comment about a lawyer. Um, he said, he, he cut me off. I was asking him specifically about what he had just said that I thought was very important. So, so let's go back to that first then. Um, you indicated you were talking to him and he made comments that you thought were important. What were those comments? Uh, he had made a comment that um, the Bible says that you kill your firstborn, you kill your secondborn, you, you kill your thirdborn, but first you're supposed to kill your wife I didn't kill my wife. So I really thought that was a, a very important comment that he had just made. And I was, um, I wanted him to repeat to me some of the things that he had said. And I was asking him about that and he cut me off. Um, he stopped me from talking and said, um, I'll just, in all in one sentence, he says, I'll just wait for a lawyer. I really don't know. Like, give me a couple days, I'll talk to a lawyer and get nice, good answers. He says that all in uh, basically one breath. So when he said, I'll, I'll just wait for a lawyer, I don't know, give me a couple of days, let me talk to a lawyer and I can get some nice, good answers for you. What, what did you think of that? I didn't know, I was confused because initially he says that he'll wait, but then he covers it up with, he really didn't know. So if he didn't know, I don't know what he means by it. And then he continues on almost and talks about almost like I'm going to let him go for a couple days, um, which obviously was not going to happen. So um, it really muddied the water for me as far as what he had just said about a lawyer. Now, you said that um, you were, well, I mean, with the words in your mouth, but you just talked about he asked for a lawyer or whether he asked for a lawyer what he said in regards to getting a lawyer and that you were trying to clarify that, I think is how you put it. I said that he muddied the water and I felt obligated to explore that. So then, if it wasn't clear to you, why did you say, I understand? Uh, again, because I'm trying to connect and develop rapport with him. And what I did understand was that he was confused. So I explored it. Well, you said, I understand. And then you basically asked him, do you have a lawyer? And you went down that path, correct? I said, I understand. Very softly said, I understand. Okay. Because I'm trying to continue that rapport that I'm developing with him. But what I really understood was the comments he just made were not clear. And I needed to clarify that. So you were confused about what he said, but you said, I understand. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that I said, I, I understand because I am calmly talking to him, developing rapport. But what I really understood was he just muddied the water with what the comments that he just made in the single breath about he really didn't know his words. I really don't know if he doesn't know. I don't know what he wants. Well, I really don't know. You took that to reflect on his request for a lawyer or what he'd been talking about up to the minute before? No, we were talking about his request to wait for a lawyer. I really don't know. If he doesn't know, I don't know. So like, why not say, hey, I'm not clear here. Do you want a lawyer or not? Should we get you a lawyer? Why don't you do that? I, I don't know why I didn't say that. I explored it the way that I felt was appropriate. 
Now, because this confession was thrown out, this was obviously not the end of the line because there still were two living victims that witnessed the entire thing happen. The only problem with this is the two surviving victims would have had to testify against him and tell the jury everything that they saw happen on this day. Essentially, they would have to relive the worst day of their life. On March 25th of 2024, Chad pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity due to serious mental illness. It was requested that Chad undergo a psychiatric evaluation to determine his competency. It was found that he did not have any serious mental illness that would completely block his judgment between knowing what's right and wrong. While he may have exhibited some symptoms of mental illness, he knew that what he did was wrong. Now, at this point, the prosecution did not want to go to trial. They did not want to force the mother and sister to get up on stand and testify to the worst thing they have ever seen in their lives. So because of this, they ended up agreeing on a plea agreement. But this plea agreement does mean that Chad avoids the death penalty. This plea agreement was also agreed upon by the surviving victims, which is extremely important. On August 2nd of 2024, Chad accepted this plea agreement. He pled guilty to three counts of aggravated murder and two counts of felonious assault. The boy's mother and their sister made very emotional victim impact statements that were both read during Chad's sentencing hearing. I am the person who I am today because of you. And no matter what anyone says, you raised me well and you gave me an amazing life and I will forever be grateful for the memories and time you spent with me. Ever since what you've done, my life has been something I would never wish upon any family. It is the most heartbreaking and emotional thing anyone could go through. Chad, I miss you and I miss the boys dearly and nothing will ever be the same again because of you. Whenever something exciting happens, I always just want to tell you because I know you would be so proud of me. Softball to me isn't the same anymore because that was our sport and that was the boys sport. You made me an amazing ball player and whenever I play softball, there isn't one game where I don't think about you. And whenever I get a good hit or I learn a new pitch, I always wish I could tell you because I know you would be so proud of me. And when good things like that happen, it sucks to look on the sideline and not see you be there and for the boys not to be cheering me on like they always did. And Chad, I still work very hard on my grades. And I was on the honor roll this past year. And I know for a fact, if you were there to see it, you would be so happy for me because my grades have always been so important to me. Another thing that has impacted me was every single holiday. Waking up on Christmas isn't the same anymore. I don't get excited. I don't even look forward to having presents because it's not the same. I don't get to wake up early and wake the boys up. I don't get to hide the elf. I don't get to do any of the fun stuff anymore because they're gone and you took their lives. And Chad, when you go to bed every single night, I want you to know that when you took those three boys' lives away, you took mine and you took my mom's. Chad, I don't think you understand how hard it is to wake up every day and to see my friends and people around me have siblings and to hear them talk about what they did with their siblings that day or how much they enjoy having a brother. Because deep down, that hurts me so badly and so emotionally, because it hurts to know I will never get to experience another day with my three brothers or to make any memories anymore 
because their innocent lives were taken away so quickly and horribly by their own father. Their father, who they loved unconditionally and who they trusted more than anything. It is so painful to see you here and in jail for the rest of your life because I have never thought in a million years you would do this to your own children and family. And still to this day, it doesn't feel real to me that they are gone and I will never get them back. But Chad, if I'm being honest, I don't think I will ever be able to hate you. Even in 30 years from now, I will not hate you because yes, you did something so horrific and traumatic to those boys, but I will forever hold on to the memories I had with you and the boys because those are all happy memories. And those were the best times. And you gave me an amazing life and you were the best dad I could have ever asked for. I could write to you for days, but to end this off, always remember, I will never in a million years ever forgive you for what you have done and hope you pay for your actions like you deserve. But I will never hate you. On June 15th, 2023, my life was changed forever. My life was ripped away from me and destroyed. Since that day, I have spent every day grieving the loss of my three sweet, so very little sons. I grieve the loss of Clayton, Hunter, and Chase every single day. And I grieve the life that they did not get to live. I no longer get to raise them and watch them grow. I miss each one of them so very much. I miss their laughter, silliness, love, and joy for life. Where there used to be so much laughter, happiness, noise of rowdy little boys, there is now silence and emptiness. I would do anything to push them on the swing cover them up one more time, and hear their little ways of saying, I love you. All of it gone when I should have had so much more life left to live with them. I asked myself how a mother is supposed to carry on a life as a mom with one child left here on earth and three gone forever. I struggle every day with the will to get up or give up. Life for me is the true pain and suffering. I will never agree to think that any form of punishment could amount to the form of torture and suffering I have to endure each day. Such as seeing children and seeing siblings together as I watch be without her brothers and seeing families together as I no longer have mine. Having to live a life where I'm visiting the same places I once was with Clayton, Hunter, and Chase all together. Traveling in the car and no longer seeing them in the rearview mirror. This also includes our family home that holds so many memories that I cannot let go of. But now, it's just a devastating to face, again, so empty and quiet. I was injured that day, fighting with every ounce of my body to just make it stop. I struggle every day, knowing I was not successful in doing so. And now I have to live with this and wonder what more I could have done to save them. This tragedy has affected me mentally and physically. I replay the events of that day over and over. I get sick at the thought. Every day I have to learn how to cope and live with the trauma I now have. I have anger, frustration, and so much sadness. I had plans and dreams to watch my small boys grow up and become young men and to always be there for them as their mom 
and to be the best grandma I could be. My husband I trusted with everything made a decision that has left my life forever changed. I lost my husband and my children to this horrible crime. The law will never replace my life and give me back what I have lost. I will hold the life I had and lived so close to my heart forever. Grief will never go away as it is all the love that is left with no place to go. And my love for Clayton, Hunter, and Chase will never go away. And I will never let them be forgotten. I quote, when I get to where I'm going, I'll only have happy tears. Until then, I will live my days with nothing but sadness. Thank you, Judge. Oh, thank you. He was sentenced to three life sentences without the possibility of parole, and an additional 16 years for the assault charges. Chad Dorman is currently incarcerated at the Toledo Correctional Institute, and he will be spending the rest of his life in prison. Chad never told detectives why he did this. He never once revealed a motive. Absolutely no one except for Chad has any idea why he just randomly executed his three sons. This is one of those horrifying cases where there just are no answers. What possibly could have made a seemingly normal man kill his three sons right in front of their mother and their sister? What could have made this man hunt his children down one by one until each of them were dead? What could have possibly happened to make this man think about killing his sons for months before he did? And I think the biggest question of all is, why? Why would he do this? These boys had their entire lives ahead of them. They could have grown up and enjoyed so much of their lives together. But because of the actions of a monster like Chad Dorman, these boys will forever be just seven, four, and three years old. Seven-year-old Clayton, fondly known as Clayton Man. He loved making Lego creations, riding his go-kart, telling jokes, and singing and laughing, all while loving his best dog pal, Gatlin. His love language was giving gifts, whether it be finding them, creating them, or even sharing treasures. He loved his family, and he was a great big brother, often looking out for his little brothers. Four-year-old Hunter, fondly known as Hunter Dog. He loved going down to the creek and catching frogs, and his love for baseball extended beyond the ball field even to his bed, an attachment like an extra arm to connect him to his ball and glove as he slept. He loved calling his mom and sister pretty girls and telling them that he loved them every single day. Three-year-old Chase, fondly known as Chasers, loved swinging on swings and couldn't wait to be a baseball player like his big brothers one day. He loved playing with dinosaurs and pretending to be a superhero, and he was the best cuddler, wanting his mama to stay close to him and give her many hugs. He will forever be known as Mama's Baby. Before I end this video, I do want to take a moment to send my sincerest condolences and so much love to any loved ones of these beautiful boys. If you have made it to this part of the video, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this entire case. If you do like to watch this type of content, please don't hesitate to subscribe to my channel so that you can get notified as soon as I post another video. Also, please like, comment, or share this video. That would help me tremendously as I am still a very teeny tiny channel here on YouTube. And as always, please comment your opinions on this case. I absolutely love reading all of your comments whenever I can. But that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.